Hi, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name's Steve, and we're going about to do a maths challenge from the, the UK. Uh, it's the UK maths challenge, the junior one from 2017. So if you've had a go at this and you're using this video to get some insight, that's what I'm here for. It, but other, otherwise, if you want to have a go at this before you hear uh, me having a go through it, there's a link in the description down the bottom. So please uh, have a go at that. And at the end, if you get a score, please post it in the comments. Tell me how well you did. Now, the UK Math Challenge, they have three tiers. This is the easiest one. This is set out for uh, school based students from years 7 and 8 in the UK, which is uh, 11 to 13 year olds. And it is tricky for people of that age. Even the best mathematicians of that age will not get every question right. You will probably not be able to answer every question in this paper. So if you are going to do this and you're practicing for your school and you're about to do it for your school, um, make sure that when you're going through, uh, you only do the questions you know because you get penalised for questions 16 onwards if you get them wrong. The right scores is 5 marks for every question from 1 to 15, 6 marks for every question 16 to 25, but for 16 to 20 you lose a mark and for 21 to 25 you lose 2 marks. So it discourages you from guessing later on. The general way I would do this is I would try and work out the answer and then see if my answer is there. Um, they, you can't do that every question but you get the idea and basically if you're um, if you do the question and don't get one of the answers there, it means you've done something wrong, so you shouldn't just guess at that point. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's for people who enjoy maths, so it's a slightly different sort of maths than you'll get in any maths test. Um, and we're going to have a go through. I've not seen this paper before, um, but I'm hoping I'll be able to answer every question. Whether I get every question right is another matter. So we're going to crack on and we're going to jump in with question number one. And question number one says, which of the following calculations gives the largest answer? Um, so we're just going to circle the calculation that gives us the largest total. Um, so we've got 2 subtract 1 is 1. So we're just going to work these out, I think. 2 subtract 1, yeah, dear. try again. 2 subtract 1 is 1. 2 divided by 1 is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. 1 times 2 is 2. And 2 plus 1 is 3. So it's going to be this last one here. Quite an easy starter. Okie dokie. Uh, Nadia is baking a cake. The recipe says her cake should be baked in the oven for one hour and 35 minutes. She puts the cake in the oven at 11.40. At what time should she, should, should she take the cake out of the oven? So it's 11.40 plus uh, 20 minutes gets you 12. Plus another 15 minutes gets you 12.15. Plus another hour uh, gets you 13.15. So we've added 20, we've added another 15, that's your 35, and then we've added one hour, that's your hour. So we get 13.15, which is the same as 1.15 p.m. What is the value of x? So these little arrows means they're parallel, which means that is also the value of x, because they are alternate angles, you can only get that in parallel lines. And if that's x, and x makes a 360 degree circle with 303, x must be 57. The download is 95% complete. What fraction is yet to be downloaded? There is 5% yet to be complete. So 5 out of 100 is the same as 1 out of 20. So yeah, you can see the first ones are on the easier side. What is the value of 201 multiplied by 7, subtract 7 multiplied by 102? So if you're going to do this calculation, uh, you check what's, what operations we're doing, and we've got multiplication needs to be done before subtraction. So we're going to do 7 times 201 is 1407. Subtract 7 times 102, so subscribe. we're going to do all the multiplication first. 7 times 102 is 714, and we've got 1407, subtract 714, we're just going to do a takeaway. Takeaway is my least favourite uh, calculation to do. So I would go, we're going to get 693, I believe. We take 700 away, we've got 707, and we take 14 off 707, which is to take away 7 twice. So 7 to 700, and another 7 to 693. In the magic square, the numbers in each row. Each column and the two main diagonals have the same total. The magic square uses the integers 2 to 10. Which of the following are the missing cells? Um, 
So what we need is 7 and 5 is 12, and 10 and 2 is 12, and 8 and 4 is 12. We need these two end ones to add up to 12. So 9 and 3, 9 and 3. So it can't be that one. Uh, it can't be that one. It can't be that one. So it's got to be one of these two. And then what we're going to check is that this column should be the same as the centre, which is 10 plus 6 plus 2. So the centre is 18. So this column and this column must be 18. So to make this 18, that's 15, you need a 3 there, in which case 5 plus 4 is 9, plus 9 is 18. So we think it's 3, 6, 9. We think it's this one. The usual gist of a magic square, the magic number is pretty much always triple the centre square. So the magic number in this case will be 18, because it's 3 sixes. I believe that's the way it works. Um, that's only the way it works if the diagonals count. If the diagonals don't count, then things uh, things change. <clears throat> if you work out the values of the following expressions and then place them in increasing numerical order, which comes in the middle? So this is a bit like the first one, but a lot more calculation we're going to do. So we're, this is going to take us a while, I think. I'm just. I, there might be a clever way of doing this. I'm just going to work it work it out. So two thirds plus four fifths is the same as saying twelve ten twenty two fifteenths. Uh, when you multiply fractions, you can multiply the numerator and denominator. So you've got eight fifteenths. When you add these together, you're going to get twenty two eighths, uh, which is the same as saying eleven quarters. I'm going to leave it as 22 eighths. The reason is I can compare it to this one a bit easier because 22 eighths is going to be bigger than 22 fifteenths because uh, eighths is a larger fraction. Uh, dividing is the same as multiplying but you do the what's called a reciprocal of four fifths. So we're going to swap four fifths to five quarters and we're going to multiply them so it's going to be ten twelfths. And then Again, this is like the first one, this is going to be 15 eighths. So, we know that 10 twelfths is less than 1, and 3 of the fractions are larger than 1. So the smallest one is, so that's the smallest one, that's the next smallest one, and then these three are all larger than 1. Well, 22 fifteenths, we know is smaller than that, so that's the largest one. And then 22 fifteenths, is it smaller than 15 eighths? Yeah, this is almost 2. This is not almost 2. So this is the next one. Then it's that one. Then it's that one. So the answer on this particular case is smallest, next, next. So that's the middle one. That'll be A. The diagram shows a rectangle, PQRS, and T is a point on PS such that QT is perpendicular to RT. So they're basically making a right angle triangle as long as T is at the right point. What is the area of the rectangle PQRS? PQRS. Well, this triangle is half the area of the rectangle. It just has to be that way, because if you can imagine if you draw a line down there, you know that these two are the same and these two are the same. So you can see that the area of the rectangle is split up into this and this and this and this. And these two must be equal to those two. So the, the area is half. So if we can work out the area of the triangle, we can then double it. So the area of the triangle is 2 times 4 and half it. So 2 times 4 is 8. Half it is 4. Um, but then the area of the rectangle will be double that. So we think it's 8 centimetres squared. There will be other ways of doing that one. The other way of doing it is you could do Pythagoras. You could use Pythagoras to work out the length of SR and the length of QR and um, get those in root form and you'd get something like root 2 multiplied by 2 root 2 or something like that and you'd get you 8. In William Shakespeare's play As You Like It, Rosalind speaks to Orlando about he that will divide a minute into a thousand parts. Which of the following is equal to the number of seconds in one thousandth of one minute? Right, so one a minute has 60 seconds, and a thousandth of a minute will be that. So it's going to be the same as 6 divided by 100. 6 divided by 100 is 0 0.06. Uh, the 
Which of the following integers is not a multiple of 45? I like these questions. So 45, we're going to split that into two numbers we can check easily. So I can check if it's multiple of 5 is easy. And this also has to be multiple of 9, because 9 5s are 45. So what we're going to do with these numbers is check two things. One, are they all multiples of 5? Well, in this case, they are. And two, are they all multiples of 9? Well, based on the question, uh, one of them will not be. And the way to check if something's a multiple of 9 is if you add the digits together, if they make a multiple of 9, then the original number does. So let's just check this one. 7 plus 6 plus 5 is 18. 18 is a multiple of 9, so so is that. And we're just going to check each one. 6 plus 7 plus 5 is going to be the same total of 18. 5 plus 8 plus 5 is 18. 4 plus 9 plus 5 is 18. And 3 plus 0 plus 5 is 8. So it's going to be that one. If you try to divide, if you're not sure, you could just try and divide them all. So if you had time at the end of a paper, to check you're right, you could try and divide 305 by 9. Um, and you find out that it doesn't work. Seven squares are drawn on the side of a heptagon, so that they are outside the heptagon, as shown in the diagram. What is the sum of the seven marked angles? Hmm. My guess I guess it's 360. Let's see if I can prove it. I think it's 360. So I think... Yeah, I'm almost certain 360, but we need to try and show why that's the case. And they've picked a heptagon, and the heptagon doesn't divide nicely. A heptagon is a seven-sided shape, so the usual... I wonder if there's an easy way of doing it. So if you have your hept your, your seven-sided shape, the interior, the interior angle and the exterior angle make up 180. To work out the exterior angle of a heptagon without these squares in the way, you would do 360 divided by 7 and that will get you this 360 over 7 which is going to be 15 a bit and then oh yeah so I, I can I'm going to explain it to you without actually working out what this is so basically and that's, that would work out one and then if you have your heptagon this is a regular heptagon uh, then you have your hepton, this is awful, but that all of those being the same size, that's how you'd work them out. Now, they're not the same size in this particular case, but I think this would work for any size square. So, draw the joint point. This would work for any size square you stick, stick on the edge. And you'll notice that the total exterior angle here, so this exterior angle is the, the 50 and a bit heptagon part plus 180 degrees. But well, what we're going to do, instead of saying it's 180 degrees plus this, this little heptagon bit, we're going to say that the 180 degrees is made up by two squares, there's your 180 degrees, and the same angle, because they've got to be the same size. So rather than doing 180 plus the exterior angle, we're going to stick the exterior angle in the middle of two squares, and the two squares get you the same 180 that these do. So this angle here, plus the same angle, plus the same angle all the way around, adds up to 360. And we've just changed the representation of how it's been shown. So I don't think I've explained that very well, but I didn't need to work out any angles to know that the answer will be 360. So apologies for that. Last year at the school where uh, Jill teaches mathematics, 315 out of 600 pupils were girls. This year the number of pupils in the school has increased to 640. 
the proportion of girls is the same as it was last year. How many girls at the school this year? So we know that we want 315 out of 600 to be the same as something out of 640. We want the proportion to be the same. So this is the same as saying, uh, we can divide by 5, so this is the same as saying 63 over um, uh, 120. And then we can divide this by 3 to get 21 over 40. And then we've got two options. We can either add, there's your extra 40 students, so we want an extra 21 girls. I believe. It's just over half. This is just over half. So if you're adding 40 students on, 21 out of every 40 students must be girls for it to be the same. So we're going to add 21 onto 315. Uh, it's going to get us 336, which is that one there. The other way of doing it is what you could do is you can multiply this by how many 40s in 640? You can multiply by 16, and 21 times 16 will be 336. Um, but we didn't need to go down that route. Consider the following three statements. Doubling a positive number always makes it larger. Squaring a positive number always makes it larger. And taking the positive square root of a positive number always makes it smaller. Which statements are true? If you double a positive number, you do always make it larger. So what we're going to try and do, to prove something like this is wrong, you just need to prove it's wrong for one number. So squaring a positive number always makes it larger. If we square 0.5, which is positive, 0.5 squared is 0.25, and that is not larger. But that one is not true. Taking the positive square root of a positive number always makes it smaller, which statements are true. If we take the square root of 0.25, we get 0.5, because the square root of a quarter is a half. Um, so again, this is not smaller because we've square rooted a number and made it bigger. These are effectively converses. So these are opposites to each other. So if one is false, the other will be false as well. Uh, so the uh, the question is, which one of the following statements are true? The only one that is true is that one. Matthias is given a grid of 12 small squares. He is asked to shade grey exactly four of the small squares, so his grid has two lines of reflection symmetry. How many different grids could he produce? So because it's a rectangle, for a rectangle to have a line of symmetry, your two options are that and that. There's no other options. There's no diagonal lines of symmetry in a rectangle. So what we need to do, we need to be aware, is that to, for it to have two lines of symmetry, if you put anything in these two squares, the others are fixed. So if you put it here, you have to also put it here, here, and here. So that is one possibility. The other possibility is if you put it here, you then have to put it here, here, and here. And they're fixed. So they're the only two possible ways of doing that. The third possibility is he has to colour in four squares. What you can't do is colour in this one and not that one or that one. And then if you colour in either of these, you also have to colour in that one. So there's, that's one option, colouring in that one. That's two options, and they're fixed throughout. So if you do that one, you're doing all the cons. If you do that one, you're doing all these. And then the third option is if you do this on the central line, if you do that one, you can do that one. So if you colour in that one, you have to do that one. And then you've got to do two more, but you can't do it in any of those four or those eight spaces. So your last two has to be there and there. Uh, they're your only options. If you could colour in four or fewer, you would have another two options. Basically, you could have these two end ones and these two centre ones without the others. Um, because you have to, it has to colour in exactly four, there's only three options. Effectively, if you've got your rectangle, the three options are going to be, oops, there's my rectangle. You can have the corners. Same again, you can have your rectangle, oops. You can have the four down the centre. And then the last one, you can have your rectangle, oops, again, you can have the, that one, that one, that one, and that. They are four options. That probably three options. 
What is the remainder when the square of 14 is divided by the square root, apologies, the square of 49 is divided by the square root of 49? Hmm. Oh, it's just going to be 0. So 49 squared will be 7 to the power 4, and the square root of 49 will be 7. 7 to the power 4 divided by 7 is 7 to the power 3, with no remainder. So even though we, we do know what 7 cubed is, it's 343, but we didn't need to work that out. All right, we're now at the point that if you're going to do this, uh, and at this point onwards, if you've guessed any of these, you're going to start losing marks. So at this point here, if I ever get to the point where I can't work out an answer, I'm going to leave it blank and I'm not going to guess. In New 3 land, there are three types of coins, the 2p, the 5p and one other. The smallest number of coins needed to make 13 pence is 3, and the smallest number of coins needed to make 19 pence is 3. What is the value of the third type of coin? So how many ways are there to make 13p using these coins and one other? We can pick what the coin is. So you could have a 2p, a 5p, and a 6p. You could have a 2p. Uh, I assume we can't do half, half pennies. So we can have a 2p, a 2p. That is 9, and then, uh, sorry, 4p, that's a 9p. Or you can have a 5p, a 5p, and a 3p. So they are the three ways to make 13 pence using uh, twos and fives and one other coin. <coughs> could you have a 5 and something else? Oh, no, you could, have, you could also have a 5p and then two 4ps. Yeah, that would work as well. Okay, so we're making three coins using two fives and one other choice. So we can have two five six, two two nine, five five three, or a single five and two fours. You can't have a single two p because then you're left with eleven pence to make up with two coins, and you can't have the same coin twice making eleven p. And the other choice we've got is we are going to try and make do the same with nineteen p. So we can have two p, two p, thirteen p. No, uh, 15p. We can have 2p, 5p, 7, and 12p. We can have two 5ps uh, and a 9p. So it's looking like 9p. Uh, we can have a single 5p because uh, that gets us 7p, 7p. And for the same again, you can't have a single 2p, because if you have 2p, you need two coins to make 17 pence that are the same, and you can't do that. So my guess is that the only the only coin that appears on both rows of the of that isn't 2 or 5 is a 9p. We've got a 9p there and a 9p there. We think the answer is 9 pence. <coughs> I add up all even numbers between 1 and 101. Then from my total, I subtract all odd numbers between 0 and 100. What is the result? Right. So we're going to all even numbers between 1 and 100. Oh, OK, this is quite nice. <laughs> uh, I think it's just going to be 50. So basically, the numbers here are 2, 4, 6, all the way up to 100. And the numbers in this one are 1, 3, 5, all the way up to 99. And there's going to be exactly the same number of numbers in each list. And you'll notice that in every pair, the even numbers are one larger. So that's one larger than that. That's one larger than that. That's one larger than that. So the answer is going to be 50, because there are 50 pairs of numbers where the even number is one larger. So if you're adding these up, and then adding these up and taking them off, it's the same as taking each of the even odd numbers off the even numbers. So 2 tick 1 is 1, 4 tick 3 is 1, and you're going to have 50 ones. That was nice. What is the sum of the digits in the completed crossword, cross number? All right. Hmm. So we're going to have to do this cross number. So we want a cube, a square, and a power of 11. So 
the the weird thing is I actually the easiest one to do is powers of eleven and there's a nice way to do powers of eleven if you've never seen it. So eleven to the power naught is one because everything to the power naught is one. Eleven to the power one is eleven. Eleven squared is one hundred twenty one. Eleven cubed is one thousand three hundred thirty one. And you'll notice that what we're making here is Pascal's triangle. And eleven to the power four is one thousand four hundred six fourteen thousand six hundred forty one. 11 to the power of 5 is very weird. What you have to do, this is our number, so I'm going to fill this in now. Let's just do 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And 1 across is a cube, and 1 down is a square. Well, the only square number that ends in a 4 is 64. So the only cube number that ends in a 6 is 256, which is 6 cubed. Um, and so let's work this out. So 2, 7, 13, 14, 18, 24, 28, 29, which is one of the options we've got. Uh, not at the moment, thanks. Bye bye, Netflix. Um, and so if you want to work out 11 to the power 5, it would be 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. However, uh, this isn't a number, so what you then have to do is carry. So you've got a 1 at the end, and then you've got a 5. Then you've got 10, which is 0, carry 1. Then you've got 11, which is a 1, carry 1. Then you've got 5 plus the carry is 6, 1. So if you want to check, you'll notice that that's the same as that, apart from the fact that the 10s I've had to carry. This is 11 to the power 5. And you can work out 11 to the power 6 as well without a calculator. So that's just a little trick I know. I don't know how you'd approach that if you didn't know your powers of 11. I suppose you'd you'd do it, you'd keep times in by 11 until you got a five digit number, maybe. Maybe that's how you'd do it. The diagram shows a regular hexagon, P, Q, R, S, T, U, and a square, P, U, W, X, and an equilateral triangle, U, V, W. What is the angle of T, V, U? T, V, U. So what we're looking for is that angle there. So this triangle here that we're making is isosceles because that angle is the same as that one. Sorry, that length is the same as that. Because this is regular, which means these lengths are the same as the squares, and the squares is regular, which means it's the same as the hexagon, and the hexagon is regular. So all the lengths of every side here are the same. So what we're going to do to work out T, V, U is we're going to work out the angle at U, and to do that we know that there's 90 here, there's 60 here, and there's 120 here. Um, and if you're not sure of how to work out a hexagon, there's a few ways of doing it, you could, you could you, you learn the formula, but a hexagon is made up of uh, six equilateral triangles, so two 60s is what you're making here. So we're going to work out the angle at U. So the angle at U will be 360 subtract 60 plus 90 plus 120. So 60 plus 90 is 150, is 270. So 360 minus 270 is 90. So if the angle at U is 90, that means the angle at V is 45. The range of a list of numbers, list of integers, is 20 and the median is 17. What is the smallest possible number of integers in the list? I think it's 3. So let's see if we can do this. We could have 1, 17, and 21. Can we get any fewer than that? Oh, we could. We could do two if they're integers. So if they add up to 34, so that would work. So we know we can do three. So we know it's not four or five. I think we can do two. You can't have one integer because you'll never get a range of 20 with just one number. So I think you can do two. If you had what about if you had seven and 27? That would work, wouldn't it? They add up to 34, which means halfway point is 17, 
and they're 20 apart. That would work. Because the median doesn't need to be a number in the list. The median is just a middle number, and if you've got two in two in the middle, in this case just two numbers, it's the middle of the two. So we believe it's two. Right, so we're going to swap to our other screen. We're going to get our pen back out. And we're ready to go. All right, we're on to the five hardest questions in the challenge now. So we're going to give this our best shot. Um, the small trapezium on the right has three equal sides and angles of 60 and 120. Nine copies of the trapezium can be placed together to make a larger version of it as shown. The larger trapezium has a perimeter of 18. What is the perimeter of the smaller trapezium? So because of the way it works, we know that that has to be an equal actual triangle. Because these are base 60. So if we do that, and you can see that basically what you're doing is you're cutting the trapezium itself into an equal actual triangle. So you're cutting that off. Yeah, so the trapezium itself, the one we've got is, I don't know if you can see from the diagram, the trapezium we've got is made up of three equilateral triangles. That's 120. So if you cut off an equilateral triangle there, you cut off an equilateral triangle there, and from the diagram you know that if you do that you'll get a parallel parallel line here, so you'll be able to split it into two. So the trapezium itself is made up of three equilateral triangles. You know it's not extended further because otherwise it wouldn't fit together like it does. Effectively, you can, you've got an equilateral triangle there, you can cut that one from that one, and then you from that one, you can cut that one. So you're cutting them all into equilateral triangles. So if that is the case, if that is the case, uh, then we know that the we know that the top is 1x, however long the top is, and the bottom is 1x, 1x, because they're equilateral triangles, so they're all the same length, so 2x. So we know from our trapezium that the bottom length is double the top length. So what we're going to do is we're going to call the top length x and the bottom length 2x and we're going to work out the perimeter of this. We know the perimeter of this is 18 so we can hopefully work out what the perimeter of this one is because the perimeter of this one will just be a total of uh, 5x's. So we've got the perimeter of this one is 2x plus x, 2x plus x, 2x plus x, 2x plus x, 2x plus x. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, lots of 3x. So 15x is 18. Which means, so that's the perimeter of everything. I'm not going to work out what x is. I'm actually just going to divide these by 3. 5x is 6. So whatever x is, it's going to be 1.2 probably. Uh, whatever x is is 1.2, but basically, because I've simplified this one to 5x equals 6, we're only after 5 We're not trying to work out where x is, because once we know x, we're going to find 5x anyway. So we're going to work out 5x from this one. We're just going to say it's 6. In the window of... <laughs> sometimes bridge, sometimes math. Yeah, this is, um, this is a junior math challenge from 2017 from the UK. I stream them and put them up on YouTube at a later date. So most of them I haven't seen before. Um, and I do them and mark them for people who want to see how I approach them before they do their own little exams, or just for fun, really. Um, I play Magic the Gathering as well, and I do some Among Us, so I do lots of things. In the window of Bradley's Bicycle Bazaar, there are some unicycles, some bicycles, some tricycles. Laura sees there are seven saddles in total, 13 wheels in total, and more bicycles than tricycles. How many unicycles are in the window? I can't see an elegant way of doing this, so we're just going to 
fiddle about. So we've got unicycles, bicycles, and tricycles. Um, and if we have one of each underneath, I'm just going to count down how many wheels. So if we've got one here, we've got one wheel. If we've got one here, we've got two wheels. And if we've got one here, we've got three wheels. That's six. We have to have more bicycles and tricycles, so we have to do that. That's eight. And there are 13 wheels in total, so if we have five more unicycles, we won't have seven saddles in total. So we're going to need at least one more bike, because if we have one more trike, we have to have one more bike. We have to have at least one more bike. So now we're on 10. And then what we need to have is two more that have a total of three wheels between them. Because we've got five saddles total. We have to have two more which have three wheels between them. So I believe if you have two unicycles, that's two. If you have four bikes, that's eight. And one tricycle, that's another three. In total, you've got seven seats, as in seven different numbers. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 gets you the right number of wheels. So we think this is the case, in which case, how many unicycles are in the window? We think it's two. Question 23. The positive integers from 1 to 150 inclusive are placed in a 10 by 15 grid so that each cell contains exactly one integer. And the multiples of 3 are given a red mark, the multiples of 5 are given a blue mark, and the multiples of 7 are given a green mark. How many cells have more than one mark? Weirdly, I've done a very similar question to this recently. Hang on. How many cells have more than one mark? Hmm. This is slightly this is slightly different. Right, so the way I'm going to do this is Morning Ella. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to work out how many cross multiples of 3 and 5 there are. So the way I'm going to do that is um, there are 50 multiples of 3 between 150 and every 5 of those is a multiple of 5. So there are 3, there's 50 and of those, a fifth of those is a multiple of five. So three and five is ten. Three and seven. So again, how many multiples of one to 150 are multiples of three? There's 50 of them. And of those, one seventh of them will be a multiple of seven as well. So there's seven. And I'm now going to pair up 7 and 5, so 5 and 7. How many multiples of 5 are there between 150 is 30, and every 7 of those, which is 4. So there are 10 plus 7 plus 4 that have more than one mark, but we, what we need to do also is remove the ones that have a mark for, that have 3 marks. So we're going to remove, subtract, the ones that have 3s, 5s, and sevens and the easiest way to do this is 
Five sevens is 35. Three thirty fives is 105. There's only going to be one, i.e. a seventh of this is one and a bit of one. A fifth of this is one and a third of this is one. So either way around you do it. So we're going to subtract one off the end. So 10 plus 7 plus 4 is 21. Subtract 1 is 20. OK, I've gone, some, I've gone wrong somewhere. Because what we're doing, the problem is, we're counting 105 three times. We're counting it three times. We're counting it in each of these. So we're going to subtract 2. Yeah, OK, it's good that 20 wasn't an option. 105 is a multiple of all three of them. And we've counted it here and here and here. So we need to take... We need to count one of them, so we'll count this 105, but not this one or this one. So we think it's 19. If that makes sense, what I've done. And this, and I'll just tell you now, this only works because they're what's called co-prime. Neither of them share a factor, which means you could, which means you can do this if you want to work at how many. Number between 1 and 600 are multiples of 2 and 7. You just divide it by 2, then divide that answer by 7, rounding down. And that's what we've done. We've divided 150 by 3, then 5 to get 10. 150 by 3, then 7 to get 7 and a bit, which we round down to 7. And 150 by 5, then 7 to get 4 and a bit. But for each one of these, we're counting the multiple that's all three of them three times, so we only need to count it once. So we take it off. I hope that makes sense. A large solid cube is cut into two pieces by a single plane cut. How many of the following four shapes could be the shape of the cross section formed by the cut? So I think, as I've seen this before, I think I know which one this is going to be. Well, I know you can do I know you can do this one and this one. Let's see if I can show you why I'm leaning towards it. So the software I'm currently using is different to what I normally do and uh I don't think it's as good at drawing shapes and stuff. So there's my poorly drawn cube. When you make a cut, the cross section will be equal to the number of faces that the cut goes through. So imagine I cut it here, here, diagonally down and comes out here. I'm cutting this corner off, so I'm cutting kind of like that, slicing through there. You can see that the cross section will be an equilateral triangle. Um, and the general gist is every cut you, every edge of the original shape that you go through will give you one extra, uh, every, yeah, every edge you cut through on the 3D shape will give you one extra side on the 2D shape. So you know you can make a lot of um, three threes because you can cut through three edges. So we know we can make this one, and in actual fact, if you take this point at the end and you move it to here, you can see that now the triangle you're making, keeping the other two points the same, the triangle you're making now, when you cut through like that, is going to be that one. So you can do that one too. Now, I know if you dangle a cube, and this is just something I know, I know if you dangle a cube, and cut it so that you've cut off half its volume, you're cutting it as near to the middle as you can, you can drop it in some acid and pull it up. You cut through every, you cut through six edges. I know you can definitely make a regular hexagon. So my, my, my guess is it's this one, and I'm trying to think if you can possibly cut it in such a way that you'd have a wider bottom bit than top bit. I don't think you can. Can you cut through four faces? 
Yeah, the problem is you can cut through four faces, but I don't think you can cut through four faces and get a shorter side one than the other because of the way that the symmetry of the cube works. So I'm pretty sure you can do this one. If you basically, if you if you dangle it and cut off half its volume, and you definitely you've definitely made a, a hexagon because of the way because you, you're dangling it from one point. You basically your the point you're dangling it from is at the top. Let's see if I can picture this. So you're dangling this cube from this top point. Uh, and your cut goes through six faces. It's basically going through... Uh, I just need to cut through that top one there. Oops. So I'm going a bit higher. Go there. So you can see you've got one cut, two cuts, three cuts, four cuts, five... I've missed one out here. Oh yeah, and you cut through that back line as well. So you can cut through six faces, so you can make a hexagon. And I think if you move that line, that will make a regular hexagon. I think if you move that line up, you're making this hexagon here. Because when you're cutting this line up, that these two points, all of these will effectively give you a uh, regular hexagon. But if you move them, if you cut this line slightly higher, and the points are here and here, you're going to get a shorter line there, which is where you get this from. So I think you can do this one, and I hope I've tried to explain why that's the case. Yeah, if you cut through there, you're going to get a shorter side here, and a longer side here, and then a short side, then a long, a long side down there, then a short side, then a long side up here. Yeah, you can definitely do this one. So I think my guess is you can't do this one. Is a trapezium possible too? All right, let's see if we can think of it. I'm being told by my chat that a trapezium is possible. In my head, I don't see how you can get... A short cut like a rectangle but tilt it. So you're all suggesting this is someone in my chat. I might be right. I, I might I might I might get this one wrong, you see. So you're suggesting, let's have a look. So if we are suggesting, there's my cube. So you're saying cut to get a rectangle. So if you cut to get a rectangle, what you would do is you would cut here and here. But to get a rectangle, you wouldn't do parallel to the base. You'd go further down, you'd go here and here. So you'd go lower down. So the, the rectangle you're making would be something like that. So you can make a rectangle, and how would you get a trapezium? Because uh, the, the opposite edges will be the same length. I don't think you can do it. I might be wrong. Cut along one edge. So you're cutting from here, you're cutting like that. Oh, like grating trees. So basically, you're saying um, you're saying cut away one long corner. I'm I can't visualize what you're saying. So I'm going to I'm going to go this, and then when we mark our answers, vulture, um, we will see how right you are, if that's okay. So I'm going to go three because I think this is the hardest one to visualize, and I don't think you can do that. Just my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Right, I'm going to go that. And hopefully my diagrams were helpful enough to say why I was at least right with the three I think we can do. Uh, the distance between Exeter and London is 175 miles. Sam left Exeter at 10 o'clock on Tuesday for, Lon for London. And Morgan left London for Exeter at uh, 1 o'clock or 1300 hours the same day. 
They travelled on the same road up to the time when they met. Sam's average speed was 25 miles per hour. And Morgan's average speed was 25 miles an hour. At what time did Sam and Morgan meet? Okay, so what we're going to do is work out how far apart they were when Morgan left. So Sam left Exeter at 10 o'clock and Morgan left for London three hours later. So after three hours, Sam did 25 miles an hour, so Sam's in 75 miles, which means they're 100 miles apart. Okay. At what time did Sam and Morgan meet? Oh dear, I don't, I, there'll be a nice elegant way of doing this, but four hours, uh, Sam's gone another 25, Morgan's gone 35, they're now 40 miles apart. And in an hour they can do 60 miles, but they're only 40 miles apart, which will be two thirds of an hour. So if they can do 60 miles between them in an hour, bear in mind they're going opposite directions, they're covering a total of 60 miles per hour. To do 40 miles, it's going to take them two thirds of the time because 40 is two thirds of 60. So I think it's going to be 1440. Okay. Right, we're going to score it and just double checking the way it's going to score. I will reconfirm exactly how the score is done. Uh, we're going to get five marks for the first 15 questions. We're going to get six marks for the last 10 questions and if we get any questions wrong in the last 10 we're going to lose one mark for question 16 to 20 and two marks for question at 21 to 25 so we're going to go uh, back to the start and we're going to get a green pen so we've got our green pen and we're just going to mark what we've done and if we get one wrong i've got the answers here so i can at least talk through why we've got it wrong so question one is e Question two is D. Question three is also D. Question four is E. Question five is C. Question six is D. Question seven is A. Let's do a quick way of doing that. No, they just wrote them all out. Question eight is B. Question nine is D. Question 10 is E, question 11 is B, question 12 is D, let's just hold down, question 13 is C, question 14 is B, 15 is A, and now we're on to the wrongs, we get them wrong, so if we get any of these wrong we lose a mark, but question 16 is D. Question 17 is B, question 18 is A. Oh, I've got 6 cubed wrong, 6 cubed is 216, there's a 1 there. So we did the right, we got all the other digits right, but I worked at 6 cubed, I got 6 cubed wrong, it's 216 instead of 256. Oh, uh, 256 is 4 to the power of 4. Yeah, that's it. I got them wrong. So the correct answer is A. So I'm going to lose. Uh, I'm going to lose a mark for question 18. Question 19 is A. Question 20 is B. And we need to swap to the other screen. I can only do 20 questions before I have to get another page out. Uh, question 21. Uh, question 21 is C, question 22 is B, question 23 is E, and I've been proven wrong, I can already see in the diagram, question 24 is E, so we're right with this one, but 
what we what we are going to do to work out the other one is we are going to cut across the diagonal of one long face at the bottom. So we're going to cut across this diagonal here, and we're going to tilt it to this point and this point. So effectively, we're cutting like that. There we get it now. So I assume that's what you were trying to explain to me, um, Vulture. So hopefully you can see that, but you can get you can get that. So I'm going to lose I'm going to lose another two marks there. And question 25 is E, which means our score. We're going to get 10 five pointers for 50. We're going to get eight six pointers for 48, uh, and then we're going to lose one and two. Apologies, we're going to get 15 five pointers because it's 15 questions. 75. Oh dear. 75 add 48 is 123. Take one, take two is 120 out of 135. Uh, that is it for the day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't do links, I'm afraid, in chat, but I, what I'll do, I will. I, uh, if I bring up the drawing they've got, oops, not that one. If I bring up the drawing they've got, if you can see, uh, that worked. Yeah, that's the drawing they've got. So you can see that we got the three. We got three right. We got I, what I considered the hardest one right, and then obviously I missed this. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't fathom how you could get a top and bottom edge that were different. Um, but yeah, I see what you mean. You could. You could. You could cut if you if you had these two points here and here, you'd have a rectangle, wouldn't you? And then you tilt it back. Yeah, absolutely right. Well spotted because I did not spot that one. Um, and you can talk. You can see here they're talking about co-primes, which is what we were talking about as well. This bit here, I don't think you can see my mouse. Anyway, that is that is what we've got today. So that's uh, not my, one of my better challenges. I made a a mistake and then an error, I think. So the mistake was just working out to six cubed wrong, and then an error is I actually got one wrong. So Vulture, well done for spotting that, um, and thank you very much if you have watched him. I'll be posting this up on YouTube in the next day or so. But if you have done it and you have been watching on YouTube, please comment in the post below with what score you've got. Any questions you particularly liked. There were some I liked. Uh, that was quite nice. Um, yeah, that was fiddly. That was fiddly. That was quite nice. Uh, thank you for the explanations. I just joined at the end. Love the math. I do too. I love some math. So, yeah, there's some nice questions here. Um, that was nice. That was quite a cheeky, che cheeky one. Uh, yeah. So I think on the whole, it was a fair paper. So if you've had a go and you found it okay, then yeah, I think that was one of the medium junior ones. Uh, but I'm going to tune in later in the week and I'm going to do uh, the intermediate from 2017 and then the senior one from 2017. So if you want to have a go at that ahead of time, uh, please be my guest. Otherwise, uh, I've been Steve and thanks for watching.